In October of 1347, devastation and disease came to the shores of Europe. Twelve ships from the Black Sea docked in the port of Messina in Sicily, and as citizens waited on the docks to welcome the sailors home, they were horrified to discover that almost everyone aboard the ships had been lost. They were still there, but they had succumbed to a mysterious illness, their bodies covered in terrible black boils. Everyone was warned to get away, to let the authorities clear these ships of death out of the harbor, but it was already too late. The Black Death had arrived. The people of Europe had heard rumors, whispers of a great pestilence working its way through the trade routes of the East, leaving desolation in its wake as it raged through China, India, Persia, and Syria. There were stories of swollen boils under the armpits, of fever, chills, aches, and pains, and before long, death. The illness worked so swiftly a man could go to bed in the picture of perfect health and be dead by morning. Now this same pestilence had landed in the harbor and come up onto land, and the invisible hand of death and sickness had a grip on everyone's throats. Shortly after the plague's arrival in Italy, it spread to the port of Marseille in France, then continued on to Rome, Florence, Paris, Bordeaux, Lyon, and London. As the pestilence continued its uncontrollable spread, people everywhere were terrified. Something was invading their homes and taking their loved ones, and they had no idea what was causing it or how to treat it. Some doctors believed that the disease was caused by miasma, foul-smelling air that carried the plague on its breeze. Others believed it to be a spiritual sickness, spread when the airborne spirit of a sick man floated out of his eyes and attacked a healthy person unfortunate enough to make eye contact with him. Others thought it must be divine punishment, God's answer to the relentless sins of mankind. Amidst the chaos and mistrust, the finger pointing and desperate attempts to find something, anything to blame, doctors did their best to treat patients with the limited information they had. Proposed cures ranged from useless and ridiculous to the downright dangerous. Some physicians prescribed bloodletting, pricking open veins to let the disease flow out of the patient's body, along with most of the blood they needed to stay alive. Others had the sick take baths in vinegar and rose water, which wouldn't harm them, but did little to stop the progress of disease. Some cures were expensive, calling for an emerald to be ground into powder and mixed into a glass of wine. Other treatments were honestly a fate worse than simple death, and included drinking one's own urine, ingesting snakeskin and precious metals, and drinking the pus from lanced boils. Working with plague patients was a potentially deadly undertaking, and the few doctors brave enough to take on the task needed to take as many precautions as possible. They were outfitted with a specialized uniform, an ankle-length overcoat, gloves, boots, and a bird-like mask ending in a pointed beak. The mask contained a rudimentary respirator-like device filled with dried flowers and herbs, spices, camphor, or a vinegar sponge. They believed that, by overpowering any potential bad smells, the scented mask would protect against the diseased air. The costume included a wide-brimmed leather hat and a wooden cane used to examine patients without touching them. All in all, a plague doctor's attire was easily recognizable and more than a little ominous in appearance. However, what might be unsettling to see today, or even a signifier of an especially dangerous and misguided humanoid anomaly contained by the SCP Foundation, was once a symbol of hope in a dark time. Seeing a man enter town in a long, dark cloak, a leather hat, and a bird-like mask meant that perhaps all was not yet lost. And so, as news traveled about a mysterious illness stealing souls in the night, turning their bodies into masses of infectious boils that needed to be rounded up and burned in pits outside of town, the people of a tiny French village were anxiously awaiting the arrival of one such plague doctor. They hoped a physician would arrive before the first person fell ill, but they could feel the cloud of illness creeping ever closer. It was a joyful day when one morning, a young man ran through the town square banging a pot and pan together and crying out, A doctor is here! A doctor has come to town! Indeed, just behind the young man came a stranger, dressed in long black robes and wearing a wide-brimmed hat. However, instead of the beaked mask, this man's face was covered in a rather curious manner. He wore a white porcelain mask, frozen in a permanent smile. Behind the eyes and open mouth, 
the villagers could only see darkness. This must, they thought, be some new preventative measure, some protective gear he had brought with him from whatever medically advanced city he had just been in. Still, before getting their hopes up, the people wanted to be sure. Excuse me? An older farmer, a respected pillar of the community, approached the masked man. Are you a physician? Indeed I am. The stranger replied cheerfully. I have reason to believe the Black Death will shortly come to this little town, and I was sent here to provide my services to anyone who may need them. In case there was any question about his identity, he produced from his side a large doctor's bag, filled with tinctures and tools, with rags soaked in vinegar and vials of ground-up eggshells and saffron. The townspeople couldn't help but feel lucky that such a well-equipped physician had come to their town to arm them with the tools they needed to combat the plague. Later that day, their fortune seemed to double when yet another stranger strode into town. This man was dressed far more traditionally, in the garb the people had come to expect from a physician tasked with treating the Black Death. This man was dressed in long, dark robes, leather gloves, boots, and a beaked mask. He carried a bag similar to that of the first doctor. The same old farmer approached the doctor, curious to see two newcomers on the same day. He couldn't remember the last time he saw so many strangers arriving in their little hamlet at the same time. Have you come to help us, doctor? He asked. Fear not, my good fellow. I have. I am here to fight the great pestilence, and I will lend you all of my efforts and years of medical knowledge. Tell me, are there any infected yet? I would be happy to treat them. The farmer shook his head. We are all healthy here, sir, but it is fortuitous indeed to have two great physicians here to aid us in these troubling times. The doctor tilted his head to the side, perplexed. Two? I assure you I am traveling quite alone. The man who arrived before you, the farmer insisted. Come and meet him, I am sure you two will have a lot to talk about. More than a little confused, the plague doctor followed the farmer to the town's tavern, where he was ushered to a table that had one occupant, the man in the white mask. He greeted the doctor with that frozen porcelain smile and a tone that was filled with mannered congeniality. Ah, another doctor. Welcome, my dear colleague. It will be a pleasure to work with you. The plague doctor sat across from the mask and stared at him inquisitively. I was unaware that there would be another physician in town. Please forgive my confusion. Not to worry. The mask's smile seemed to widen, though of course that was impossible. It will be a relief to have someone else to share the burden. I am certain we will work together quite well. Tell me, the plague doctor began, how did you come to hear of the need for a doctor in this town? It is my understanding that not have fallen ill thus far. Rumors, that is all. And in times such as these, one can never be too careful. After all, we took an oath to help those in need, did we not? The plague doctor couldn't place why, but he felt strangely apprehensive about this fellow in the white mask. Something about him did not seem quite right, from his untraditional choice of attire to the rustling sound inside of the man's bag to the strange droplets of something black that had gathered on the table in front of him. Still, perhaps the exhaustion of his journey had put him on edge. Many hands make for lighter work, and he should be grateful for the assistance promised. He was used to working alone, but he would simply have to adjust. Besides, it was entirely possible no one would become ill at all, and the letter he had received summoning him to the town was based on inaccurate assessments of the area's risk. He would stay a fortnight, evaluate the health of the people, and if nothing of important arose, he would travel onward to the next town and continue his endless battle against the pestilence. But before that fortnight could pass, someone did fall ill. The old farmer's wife ran to the tavern in the early hours of the morning, only two days after the doctors came to town. The plague doctor was already awake when she arrived, sipping a cup of tea and eating a piece of toasted bread with butter. She begged him to leave his breakfast and come inspect her husband immediately. Her husband had collapsed while milking the cows, and nothing she did could wake him. His forehead felt hot to the touch, slick with sweat. As he looked, the plague doctor could see that the farmer's body was covered in the telltale boils that he had seen so many times before. He instructed the woman to stand back, to stay away from her husband lest she catch his sickness. Then he began a thorough inspection, using his cane to lift the man's arms and check beneath them. Sure enough, there were more boils there. Your husband is very ill, he told the weeping woman. But I assured you, madame, I will do my best to make him well. We will begin by letting the blood from these areas. 
He pulled a scalpel from his bag and began the procedure. This will release the humors that have gathered in excess and allow his body to regain balance. It will not work. The voice behind him disturbed his careful work, and the plague doctor turned around to see the white-masked man watching him from the doorway. I beg your pardon? The plague doctor straightened. This man needs a different cure. Please allow me to treat him. The plague doctor hesitated, uncertain about having his methods questioned, but the pleading cries of the farmer's wife persuaded him to step back and allow his colleague to try his own treatment. Very well, I will let you work. The plague doctor left the room to give the white-masked man some privacy. The farmer's wife joined him, and the two sat in the front room of the house, waiting for whatever news the other doctor might bring. Finally, after many hours, he returned. I am very sorry. The man's white mask now bore the expression of a deep, sorrowful frown. His gloved hands were covered with blood. Your husband's condition was far too advanced. If I had arrived sooner to treat him, and if his blood had not been let so hastily by my colleague, perhaps I would have saved him. But he is with the angels now. The woman began to cry again, and as she wiped her eyes, the plague doctor noticed the masked man do the same, wiping something thick and black from the eye holes of his mask. Strange. And then there were the words he said, words that offended the doctor to his very core. Are you implying that I am to be held responsible for this lost patient? He demanded. Of course not. It was the plague that took his life, but, well, we will never know exactly what might have happened if I had arrived to treat him first. N never mind. Best not to dwell on such hypothetical matters. The white-masked man held out a cup to the grieving widow, filled with something dark and viscous. My dear lady, in caring for your husband, you are exposed to his sickness. You will take ill and follow him into death if you do not care to prevent the plague from taking in you. Please, drink this. It will keep you safe. Before the plague doctor could ask what the unfamiliar medicine was, the woman had already taken the cup with trembling hands and drank its contents in one swallow. Please do call on me if anything else troubles you. My condolences for your loss. And with that, the white-masked man was gone. The farmer was the first citizen to succumb to the Black Plague, but sadly he would not be the last. Once the disease had its hooks in the town, it was going to be difficult to root it out. In spite of taking the strange curative drink, the farmer's wife was lost only a few days later. All throughout the town more and more grew ill, and it seemed there was no relief in sight. The plague doctor did his best to treat the patients as they came, providing them with homemade tinctures of herbs and wild mushrooms, cleaning their wounds with distilled spirits, bathing them in the purest of vinegar. He even resorted to some of his more experimental treatments, those his colleagues in Paris had questioned, had dismissed as far too close to the occult and far too removed from science. He took the blood from a healthy cow and attempted to transmit it into a human patient. He deliberately stopped the heart and then started it again with the venom of an exotic snake. Still, he was unable to save any of them. He was beginning to lose faith in himself, and the people of the village were following suit. Slowly, the families of the sick were beginning to bring their loved ones to the man in the white mask instead, trusting only him to help them, and somehow help them he did. The plague doctor could never be sure what the white masked man was doing. His supposed colleague was secretive about his methods, never allowing himself to be observed. He would not leave his makeshift workshop, a room in the attic of a tavern where he saw his patients, but whatever he was doing must have worked, because for every one of his losses, there was a person whose fever broke, whose skin miraculously cleared of blemishes, and who returned home to their life just as it was before. The plague doctor couldn't understand any of it. He had cured patients before, he knew he had. His success had been renowned throughout the land, had earned him commendations from generals and kings. But now, here, ever since he met this new doctor in the eerie white mask, something was terribly wrong with his work. Perhaps the other doctor would allow him to assist, to learn from him. In his current sorry state, the plague doctor could only hope to become an assistant of a great man. Once he had absorbed some of his knowledge, perhaps then he could return to his former state, do as much good as he once had. One evening after he finished his supper of vegetable soup and crusty bread, the plague doctor summoned his courage and decided to go upstairs and pay the masked man a visit. As he lifted his fist to knock on the door, he could hear muffled voices coming from the other side. He was not ordinarily one to eavesdrop, but something in the tone of the conversation made him hesitate and listen for a moment. I'm afraid you might be right, the mask said. There is something unusual about the other doctor. 
I do not wish to cast aspirations, but it seems as if the plague only began to appear here once he arrived in town. Do you think he brought the disease with him? The other voice belonging to the local judge replied, I am sorry to say that I do. Oh, what can be done to stop this? To drive the plague out of our community? The judge asked. In my opinion, there is only one choice. The doctor must leave this town. By choice or by force, dead or alive, that will be up to him. The plague doctor clapped a hand over his beak in shock. Conspiracy against him? But why? He could hear rustling on the other side of the door, someone preparing to open it. He must hide before they spotted him. He ducked into a closet, shutting the door behind him, and tucked himself away in the dark as the judge's footsteps passed by outside. Finally, it fell silent. With a sigh of relief, the plague doctor pushed open the closet door, but there, waiting for him, was that unmoving pale white face. This time, it was smiling, a malicious, gleeful smile. Oh, hello, doctor, the masked man said. His words were polite, but his voice was cruel and cold. What have you done? Why would you tell the people such slanderous lies? The plague doctor demanded. Simple. They need someone to blame, and I won't have it be me. <laughs> the masked man laughed, then a hollow sound. Haven't you figured it out, doctor? Haven't your brilliant deductive skills led you to the answer? Why your cures have done nothing? Why all of your patients perish while so many of mine thrive? You made them ill? Deliberately? But how? And why? The plague doctor gasped in shock and horror. The how is for me to know and take to my grave. But as for the why, I'd be happy to tell you. Because no one will believe a word you say. I intend to rule this town. The first of many I will make my domain. And there will be no way to inspire loyalty in a population like freeing them from the grip of the Black Death. Unfortunate that you had to arrive and complicate my plans, but you will soon be taken care of, and then I will have nothing more to worry about. <laughs> the mask cackled again, triumphant and wicked. You villain! The plague doctor roared, grabbing at the man's robes and trying to yank him close enough to fight. He could not get a grip on the man, but the robes came loose and fell to the ground, revealing a horrible sight. Where there should have been a man, flesh and blood and beating heart, there was nothing but a skeleton, dripping black slime onto the floor. The mask covered a face of bone and desiccated skin, the body underneath a rattling marionette propelled by unnatural evil forces. It was too much for the plague doctor to take and he did the only thing he could think to do. He turned and ran. The plague doctor grabbed his cane, his trusty apothecary bag, and ran out into the streets. Please, he cried out into the night. Listen to me, you have been fooled by a devil. He brings desolation, not a cure. He is the sickness. You're a madman, the judge cried, brandishing a flaming torch in one hand, a pitchfork in the other. You brought death to our town, and now you spout lies about our savior. Please, my dear fellow, hear me! You are not safe here! The plague doctor begged. The judge lunged at him with the pitchfork, and forgetting to touch the man with his cane, the plague doctor grabbed his arm with his own hand to stop the assault. The judge's eyes went wide, and he dropped to the ground in a lifeless heap. He killed him! cried a bystander. The false doctor is a murderer! As the plague doctor watched, an angry mob descended on him, waving their torches and weapons. They would not hear reason. They would not listen. He would have to flee. The plague doctor ran until the cries of angry townspeople and the glow of their torches had faded into dark and silence. And then he ran some more. He ran all the way to a neighboring town, where he told stories of a shambling corpse in a white porcelain mask, bringing a plague of illness and deception, and could only hope and pray that these people would listen. Now go check out When Daybreaks SCP-049 and SCP-001, can SCP-049 finally cure when day breaks? For more battles of wits between the Plague Doctor and the diabolical Possessive Mask.